Good morning. morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to church. Welcome. You are at Williams this morning. Um, If you are visiting, I do see some unfamiliar faces. If you would look to the end of your pew, there should be a little welcome card like this. If you could just fill that out so we could have a record of your visit, and um, you'll drop it in the golden plate. Uh, It'll come your way in a few minutes. But everyone, grab your bulletins, and I want to hear them being opened so that you're looking on along with me. Such a nice sound. Okay, so tonight we will not have evening worship, but there's some other things going on, so listen up. I'm just going to highlight a few things, but please read over the rest of the bulletin, front and back. Um, There will be a Texas mission trip meeting This afternoon at 5 o'clock, we will meet in the uh, senior adult room, 5 o'clock. Then youth, we will have snack, so meet here at 7 o'clock. You don't want to miss, it's the shoes, and they have really good food, and they have a pool. So So that's tonight at 7. All right, so let's look for Wednesday. Um, We will have our usual church service at 6.30 for adults, children, and youth. We're going to meet a couple minutes earlier. We're going to meet here at 6 o'clock and go to assisted living and do a craft with them. And if any of y'all are interested in coming along, it's so much fun. They love just hanging out with us because we're cool, but we also bring stuff for them to do, and so that's really fun to hang out with them. And that will be at 6 on Wednesday. All righty, so that's really all that I have to mention, but it's your job to read on some other things going on, so read about it. All righty, I've done enough of my talking, so now it's your turn. Find someone to talk to this morning, or hug, or kiss, shake hands, go for it. God spoke, light, and light appeared. God saw that light was good and separated light from dark. God named light day. He named the dark night. It was evening. It was morning. Day one. Genesis 1, 3 through 5. Good morning again. We've come into this house this morning. For many of us, this is the second or third time that we've been in this room gathered for worship. I've said to several already this morning, we've been having church, it seems, all week long, and today we just continue on in the worship of our Lord together. So, as we have gathered, would you join me in a word of prayer? Great God, As we have come into this room today, as we bring with us, some of us, heavy hearts, others, hearts of joy, thoughts of peace and comfort, and others, Lord, wrestling, wrestling with our own sins, our own shortcomings, our own faults and disappointments. Lord, we bring them all into this room to turn them over to you. Trusting, Lord, that you are here. Trusting that you will speak to us. And, Lord, that what we may hear, what we may experience, what we may feel from your Holy Spirit in this place this morning, Lord, is for us. We may receive it, Lord, knowing that it comes from you, not from somewhere else. So, Lord, be with us in this time of worship. God, as we sing praises, as we pray together, as we listen 
and as we experience your presence here among us. Lord, be with us. Be with us as we worship, and may our offering be pleasing to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we're glad you're here this morning. If you would, take a hymnal and turn to page 10, A Worship the King. Let's sing the first, second, and fourth stanzas. Please stand as we sing. Turn to 422, no, not one. Let's sing the first, second, third, and fifth stanzas. First, second, third, and fifth.
Well, church, this is one of those times when, when we are excited to gather together in our midst of worship as we should be normally, but even more so now as we come to a time when we get to dedicate a child into the life of faith and, and dedicate ourselves to the upbringing and help of that child. So I'm going to ask if Jeremy and Summer and Finley would to come up here this morning. I won't ask you to preach or say anything, really, if you don't I can come up here if you want, or wherever. Hey. Don't wake her up. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, did I wake her up? No. Oh. Well, at least I can keep somebody awake. Um, we'll read. Uh, y'all didn't hear me say that, did you? Okay. Um, hear these words from Luke's Gospel, the 18th chapter. People were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. And when the disciples saw this, they rebuked him. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. This morning as we come to dedicate Finley, as you have come, I'm going to ask Jeremy and Summer that you guys make some vows. And congregation, you're going to make some vows. So, Jeremy and Summer, I'm going to ask you something, if you'll just respond with, we do. As you bring Finley this morning in this time of dedication, do you dedicate yourselves to her upbringing in a home filled with the love of Christ and the Holy Spirit? Do you dedicate yourselves to exemplify a relationship with Christ so that she may see Christ in you? And with the help of this congregation, do you dedicate yourselves to make every possible effort to raise this child in a community of believers? Now, church, it's your turn. As Jeremy and Summer have brought Finley to be dedicated today, do you all, as a body of believers, the living body of Christ, dedicate yourselves to encouraging, helping, and supporting them in this new chapter in their lives? Do you dedicate yourselves to the duty of being Christ to this family and this new child as they journey together with you in their walk with Christ? Excellent. Well, Jeremy, and Summer, on behalf of the congregation, I want to give you this certificate and this, I think this will, this is, this is kind of you, isn't it, Jeremy? <laughs> a pink New Testament there. If she can read it already, uh, she is going to rule the world. <laughs> and so, um, and so, how is she doing? You want to go for a walk? Huh? Girl, she's like, oh, don't hand me to the strange man. <laughs> oh. Hey, let's go. Oh. Oh, she's squirming. Oh, there's Mama. She's right there. She's right there. See her? There she is. You see? Oh, my goodness. That hung up around. There you go. Oh. Oh. Oh, the hairy man spooking me. Oh, there you go. Look at all those people back. Yeah, there's some pretty people back there. You see them? Don't move. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry I had to be in that picture for you. All those people, yeah, they love you. They're praying for you. Mom and Daddy's still back there. Look at these folks. Yeah, we're just going to take a little walk. Yeah. All those they never take pictures of me, Finley. But look at that. All these people, some of them you recognize over there. It's Granddaddy, Grandma. Look at them. You want a picture there, Granddaddy? (laughs) Got it. You're good. All right. But all these people, they, they're already praying for you, especially with that daddy you got. They're praying. No, Jeremy knows a good one. They're praying for you, loving you already. Even before you got here, they've been praying for you, thinking about Oh, there's another picture. This is what it's like to be famous, I think. So look at that. Oh, there's some other, some other familiar folks over there, yeah. All these people, they love you, praying for you. You get to grow up and see them. They're going to watch you grow up, pray for you as you do. They're going to love you and share the love of Christ with you, teach you all about God and the ways that he have us to go. Isn't that great? She's like, okay, give me back to Mama now. Before I hand her off, I'd like to pray. Bless. Let's all pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of children and 
for Jeremy and Summer and their witness to you and for their child, Finley. God, we pray your blessings on her and her family. Be with her as she grows. Help us, Lord, to walk beside her, to walk beside Jeremy and Summer, to help her, Lord, help them to know you more, to know you better in the days ahead. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. There's mom. Have y'all ever been blindfolded? Yes. Sarah, what happens when you get blindfolded? You can't see. So, do you think if I put this around your face, could you walk around the sanctuary for me? Mm. Can we try it? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you try it on the alley. That'd be kind of hard, wouldn't it? Why would it be hard? Because you can't see. Because it would be what? It would be dark. Dark. Do y'all like the dark? No. no. Do y'all have night lights in your rooms so yes, that if you wake yes. up? What happens if you wake up in the middle of the night and your night light's gone? Do you get up still? Or do you cry out for mommy and daddy? I just go back to sleep. You just go back to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> what if you got it? So, what, what if you really need to get up? Well, my mama, she leaves on. Um, I have a window at the end of my bed and she leaves on the porch light. Ah, uh, so there you go. So you don't have to worry about your night light going out. Because right. I know the other night I was up. And I needed to get a drink, and it was pitch black dark in my house. And it was really hard trying to find my way around. And I was moving my arms and trying to figure out how to get there. Because we I leave. Could see. I, would, I would be able to see because the light's always on in the oh, hallway. Oh, see, I'll leave the lights on in the hallway. So y'all have got the backup plan. I, mean, I might need to discover a backup plan. But <laughs> When I can't, can't sleep, I go downstairs to tell my mom and dad. Okay. <laughs> so that it doesn't. <laughs> Do they leave a light on so you can find your way downstairs? Yeah. Yeah, but it's not fun to wake up and be in total darkness, is it? Did you know that Jesus told us in the Bible that he is the light and he gives us light? What do y'all think that means, that Jesus gives us light? We can see. That we can see? That we can see the way we should live, right? And how to love? And how do we find out how to be that light and not to be in the darkness? What do we have to do to find out how to be that light? We have to read the Bible, right, and feed and come to church. And your parents have you here so you can learn about Jesus and God and what we need to do to be the light to others. So just like you have a light in your house, Jesus came to be our light. And our job when he died on the cross is now to be that light for others. And so it's very important that we go around and that we let our light shine. We let Jesus' light shine through us. Do y'all think y'all can do that? What are some ways y'all can do that? Read the Bible. How can you do it at school? Being nice when others are being ugly. Making sure the things that come out of our mouth are uplifting. Because sometimes it's really easy to say things that aren't uplifting to others, isn't it? And then we don't really mean it, but that it just kind of comes out and happens that way. So we have to make sure that we're feeding ourselves through the Bible and through listening to God's Word. So that when those chances arise in life, we're ready to be Jesus' light, right? And we don't want to be left out in the darkness, do we? And do we want to leave others in the darkness? Now, as you all remember this week, and as you start back to school in a few weeks, that we're going to let our light shine, okay? You want to say a prayer real quick? Dear Lord, we just thank you for this week and the time you've given us. And we just pray that we can always let our light shine and just show um, what your light looks like to others and just watch over and protect us in your name we pray amen all right macy and then um y'all can go and then y'all
morning is hymn 98. Jesus, we just want to thank you. We'll sing the first, second, and fifth. First, second, and fifth. Please stand as we sing. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much again for this day and all the blessings of life you give to us. We pray that you go with us, dear Lord, and help us through the day, help us through the remainder of the service, dear Lord. Be with us and help us to feel your spirit. As we pause now, dear Lord, to give back a portion of what you give to us, please take this offering and bless it to the building of your church and the blessing of your kingdom. We ask it in thy name. Amen.
please stand for the doxology.
I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 8th chapter of John's Gospel. John chapter 8, we'll be reading verses 12 through 20 there this morning. John chapter 8, beginning there in verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I have come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is valid. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is valid. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me testifies on my behalf. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. He spoke these words while he was teaching in the treasury of the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Lord, now we come to a time when we hear, when we hear you speak. Lord, may we hear your voice, your words, and not mine. And when we hear them, Lord, if they provoke us, Lord, may you speak to us in ways that show us why and how. Why they provoke us. And how we may answer, Lord, the call that you give us. Lord, we pray that you speak to us in the midst of this gathering. We hear your voice, it shapes us, changes us, calls us ever forward. Help us to hear it, Lord, through the words of Holy Scripture. Help us to hear it, Lord, in the quiet places of our minds and our hearts. Lord, help it to be a word of comfort where there is need for comfort. Challenge, provocation, Lord, where there is need for that. Lord, speak to us. Help us to hear you this morning. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. It has occurred to me recently, rather over, I suppose, the last several years, that we live in a culture dominated by sound bites. You know what I'm talking about? The never ending news cycle, and a word. A word or phrase is spoken by a celebrity, a politician, or someone who blurs those lines. Whether they speak it during a speech or an interview, that word or phrase can be hashed or rehashed over and over again until we completely associate that individual's ideology with that single word or phrase. Advertisers spend millions of dollars to create and print slogans or write jingles that are used to sort of stick in our brains. Words not only that are supposed to give us information about a product, but words and phrases that are there to attempt to persuade us to buy it. Sound bites even dominate the way that we communicate these days. Text messaging, with its limited numbers of characters per text, has become the most popular form of communicating among young people and growing among older generations. Social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter limit one's thoughts and opinions to whatever posts they can share, whatever words they can scratch out on the keyboard, or on, in the case of Twitter, only 140 characters. Perhaps it is the collective reality of an ever-shrinking attention span, or maybe it's necessary 
in a fast-paced world that doesn't seem to be slowing down. But it does seem to me that we are increasingly being dominated by a culture of the soundbite. Now, of course, this catchphrase-driven phenomenon is not exclusive to the worlds of politics, advertising, or the Internet. No, in fact, it seems to me that our modern Christian culture is tailor-made for soundbite. Pastors have their own catchphrases they like to use when preaching, counseling, or, or writing their twelfth book. We have bumper stickers with abbreviated Bible verses scrolled on them. One can even wear jewelry with slogans or mnemonic abbreviations to remind everybody that they're that kind of Christian. Any of you have a WWJD bracelet somewhere in a drawer? I believe, however, that perhaps the most troubling evidence of our faith being driven by the soundbite comes in the form of what is often called proof texting. Now, I have another name for it, but you'll have to ask me about it after church. Proof texting is when someone takes a verse or a passage and they sort of cherry-pick it out of the Bible. They pull it out of its context in order to prove a point. And it isn't always done maliciously, but it is almost always done poorly. And whether it's proof texting whether it's jewelry, whether it's bumper stickers, it seems that modern Christianity is custom-made for the soundbite, the little short slogan. Now suppose one can make the argument that the I am statements found in the fourth gospel, John's gospel, would make for wonderful soundbites, the, in Greek, the ego, a me statements. They're clean, crisp, uniform statements, and they're made by Jesus himself. They're straight to the point and complete with wonderful images like bread and light, vines and shepherds. However, we should not be so quick to simply fall into this trap of taking these I am statements and running out to get them tattooed on our upper arms or stitched onto some throw pillows to put on our couches. These words of Jesus like every word of Scripture, is made clearer and even more powerful if we allow it to speak from its context. Not simply ripped out and said, here it is, but understanding it in its context. After all, Jesus didn't randomly just go around saying things. He didn't just wander around and then come to a place and go, hey, wait, hang on, hang on, I got an idea. Hey, y'all, I'm the bread of life. He spoke those words in a specific context. After recently having broken enough bread to feed thousands of people, after having a conversation about manna, the bread that came from heaven for the Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, it had a much deeper meaning for those who had witnessed His actions as He had literally broken bread and fed. Thousands of people. The same is true of our text this morning. In Jesus' I am statement in verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now on its own, on its own, this is a, a powerful statement, isn't it? I mean, it's rich with all sorts of symbolism and meaning. But Jesus' words here, however, do not come to us as if they were printed on that tiny strip of paper and those cookies you get after eating at the Chinese restaurant. In fact, John gives us a lot of context for Jesus' words here. And he does it in verse 20. He spoke these words, John tells us, while he was teaching in the treasury of the temple. Now, I'm going to give you permission to turn in your Bible somewhere else if you have it. If you have those sort of like nice maps in your Bible that talk about the temple, these are real handy in this sort of situation. If you have that, you can find it. If not, I'm just going to tell you about it. The temple of Jesus' day was not Solomon's temple, but Herod's temple. It was an extravagant complex that, that was said to shine so brightly with its polished marble and its gold that miles and miles away from Jerusalem, on a clear day, it would gleam on the horizon. Herod's temple was more than just a, a building for folks to look at. It was an enormous religious center, divided into several sections. Just inside the first wall of the temple was what was called the Court of the Gentiles, and anybody, 
Anybody could go in this area. If there were tours around Jerusalem, this is where the tour groups would go, right? They'd be, and now we're in the court of the Gentiles, as you see, to your right, to your left, blah, blah, blah. Everybody can come into the court of the Gentiles. But that was it. No one who was not a Jew could go any farther. Through the next set of gates was what was called the court of the women. And through the court of the women, Jewish men and women were permitted to enter into this area, but women couldn't go any farther. Beyond that were places where only men could go, then the holy place where the priests could go, then the most holy place, which in Solomon's day was where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, and in Jesus' day it was where they hoped to one day bring it back. But it was here in the court of the women where the temple treasury was located. And so when John tells us that Jesus was teaching in the treasury of the temple, Jesus is speaking to Jews who come to worship. But the location of Jesus' teaching isn't the only context that John gives us. No, if you look back a chapter in chapter 7, John tells us in verse 2, Now the festival of the booths was near. Any of you ever celebrated the festival of booths? Tabernacles? Camping doesn't count. See, I understand as Baptist Christians living in Alabama in the 21st century, the ancient Jewish festivals are more than a bit lost on us. We, we think, you know, we hear some of these uh, Christian Zionists sort of talk about uh, some of the Jewish uh, celebrations, but uh, they're, they're with a spin on them. You see, we're somewhat familiar with the festival of Passover. Most of us have seen Cecil B. DeMille's epic, The Ten Commandments. Maybe you've even seen the silent version he did before that. And we still carry a bit of the traditions of Passover and the way that we observe the Lord's Supper. But when it comes to the other festivals of Judaism, I'm afraid we're not as familiar. The festival of booths, and I'm going to say tabernacles because it's hard for my South Alabama mouth to say booths without sounding funny. And maybe not slipping and saying something I shouldn't say. But the festival of tabernacles was originally a harvest festival that recalled God's provision for the people of Israel as they were wandering in the wilderness on their exodus from Egypt. And this festival lasted for seven days, and on the eighth and final day, there was an enormous celebration. The festival was so popular among the Jewish people, we might think Passover was the most popular, but it wasn't. It was tabernacles. It was so popular that people just called it the feast. They didn't say, hey, what are y'all doing this year for the Festival of Tabernacles? No, they said, hey, what are y'all doing this year for the feast? And it came with this intense association with eschatological hope. In other words, every time they gathered for the celebration of tabernacles, there was this great sense of hope that God was going to do something, just as God had done something in the wilderness. So as if this electric atmosphere of hope and anticipation were not enough to give Jesus' words meaning, what took place during the festival would have surely served as a remarkably powerful image for those who heard Jesus say, I am the light of the world. You see, during the festival of tabernacles, each night, four giant lamps were placed in the court of the women. Who? Who do we just say was teaching in the court of the women? Four giant lamps were placed there, and there were these giant golden bowls placed on the top of each of these lamps, and they were filled with oil. And the wicks for these lamps were made from last year's robes from the priests. And they would light these lamps, and the light would bathe the court, and some would say it would go all over the temple, and some would say it would even cover all of Jerusalem. And in the light of those lamps, the people would sing, they would celebrate, and we know they weren't Baptists because they danced. And they danced all night long. And it was said that this light would cover all of Jerusalem all through the night. It served as a reminder of the pillar of fire that led the Israelites through the wilderness. And when the night was over, and the lamps were beginning to sort of smolder, two priests would come down the steps of the court of the women, turn towards the actual temple, the holy place, the most holy place, and say these words, Our fathers who were in this place turned their backs to the temple of God and their faces eastward and threw themselves down eastward before the sun. But we direct our eyes to Yahweh, 
to the Lord. The celebration of tabernacles. The Jewish faithful were proclaiming their trust in God as the one true God. The light from these lamps reminding him, reminding them of his presence even in the darkest nights. And then Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Is it any wonder then that in, in perhaps in the shadow of those smoldering lamps, with the smell of that oil burning on the air, thinking about the light, and the dancing, the partying they had had the night before. Is it any wonder then that the Pharisees then say to Jesus, you are testifying on your own behalf, your testimony is not valid. In other words, you're talking about yourself and we don't listen to you talk about yourself. Of course they'd want to challenge Jesus, right? I am the light of the world. No, 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 didn't you see what we did last night? That's a reminder of the light of the world. It was common in those days before the festival to call things like the Torah, the temple, Moses, even some of the rabbis and the prophets. Oh, they're the light of the world. Look how brightly they shine. They're the light of the world. But for Jesus to make such a bold statement in such close context with the festival of tabernacles, that's too much. Where did he get off making such a radical proclamation of self-identity? I am the light of the world. No, remember the lamps above you, Jesus. Don't you get it? Those lamps, this festival, they remind us of God, of Yahweh, the light of the world. Where did you get off saying you are the light of the world? And he responds, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I'm from and I know where I'm going, but you don't know where I came from and you don't know where I'm going. You judge, he says, by human standards. I judge no one, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is valid, for it's not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. And then he says, he kind of catches them, right? He says, "Uh, your law says it takes two witnesses. I'm one and my Father is the other. And then the Pharisees, uh, I think they sort of were play acting. They, They seem, well, Pharisees always did and they still always do misunderstand what Jesus had to say. They ask him in verse 19, where is your father? They think Jesus might be referring to some earthly man, perhaps some authority. They're looking for, where's your daddy at? Get him in here. He's going to straighten you. Can you believe what your boy is saying over here? Get your daddy in here. Perhaps they were attempting maybe to sting Jesus a little bit. After all, the father that Jesus knew on earth, Joseph, we don't hear anything about him after the nativity. How many times do you think Jesus was called a bastard growing up? Where's your father? Jesus responds to their question. You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, then you would also know my father. They completely miss it. Pharisees then, Pharisees have always missed it. With all the show, all the celebration of this recent festival of tabernacles, all that was going on, all their knowledge of the law, the prophets, all of this, and the Pharisees still miss it. They're still in the dark. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Just as the light from the lamps lit the night during their party and during their festivals, just as the pillar of fire lit the way through the wilderness for those wandering children of Israel. Jesus, the light of the world, lights the way through the darkness that engulfs this world. He lights the way through the dark nights of grief. And friends, we've had a lot of those. We've had a lot of those lately. He lights the way through the dark valleys of confusion. And man, we've had a bunch of those. He lights the way the nights of depression, to the enveloping darkness of sin, darkness that we sometimes doubt and refuse to acknowledge, our own, our friends. He reveals the way of redemption. Jesus is the light of the world, and whoever follows him will never walk in darkness, he says, but will have the light of life. And who's that second testimony? The Almighty God has testified to the power of Christ. 
He's testified to his power by raising him from the dead, even the darkness of a grave. The light of the world overcomes it. And he's testified to his power by granting salvation to those who follow the light. Those who seek to be freed and liberated from the darkness. So I ask you this morning, are you just sort of celebrating in a temporary light? Are you in darkness? Is the way hidden because it's too dark to go? Is your light snuffed out? Christ, the great I am, the light of the world calls you, calls all of us to come out of the darkness. Sometimes the light is scary because it shows us things that we don't want to see. And sometimes the darkness is safer because, well, at least in there, we don't have to see the things that scare us. Sometimes the things that scare us in the dark might be mirrors in our own reflections. But Christ calls us out into the light, out of the darkness, to come and follow Him. So may you hear His call this morning. Step out of the darkness. It, it ain't, the light's not always pretty. It's not always easy. But we're always with Jesus. Step out of the darkness. Hear His call. And start the journey with Him. Out of the darkness. And into the light of everlasting life. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, light of the world, call us out of darkness, Lord. Light the way before us. And help us, God, those of us who, who claim your name, who have your light within us already. Help us, Lord, not to spread the darkness, but to eradicate it with the light of your love. Holy Spirit, stir in our hearts. Eternal God, speak to us. Christ, save us and show us the way you would have us to go. Move in our presence, move in our midst. Whatever decisions, whatever movements we must make in our lives, Holy Spirit, give us the strength to do just that this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our invitation here this morning is hymn 529, Oh How I Love Jesus. Please stand as we sing the first and second stanzas. First and second stanzas. ask if all of the folks who are
traveling with us to Texas, if you'd come up here to the front. I know who you are, so you can't not come up here. <clears throat> right, well, maybe I should scoot this way, because they're more coming from this way. Is this everybody? Well, I know Lamar's not here with us. Oh, yeah, I'm counting. Make sure y'all are up here. <laughs> Who else are we missing? Oh, yeah, okay, Carrie and Atwood. Okay, anyway, these are most of the folks who are going to Texas. Um, some of the others uh, can't be with us today, but we'll be leaving Friday morning. And I don't know what all you all have heard or known. It's been such a crazy past few months. But uh, this group will be going to the uh, Rio Grande Valley, the Texas-Mexico border, um, some of you have heard of Together for Hope, a program uh, that's through the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship that ministers to the 20 poorest counties in the country. One of those is right here in Alabama, Perry County, and I know some of you know about uh, Sowing Seeds for Hope. We're going under the sort of umbrella of that same thing. I think it's six of those 20 counties are found uh, in the Rio Grande Valley. And so uh, some of us will be uh, helping a church there in Brownsville uh, to build some classrooms. Uh, they have churches that are just really kind of growing out of their uh, worship space. We'll be doing a vacation Bible school uh, for that church and doing some other things as well. But this morning, I wanted you to see the faces of those who are going. I know you know most of them already, but to see the group that is going. And then uh, to just join me this morning as we pray for our group, for safe travel, for safety there, and that God might use us uh, in a mighty way for his kingdom. So let us all pray together. Lord, this morning we come to you thanking you, God, for this place called Williams, for this church, and Lord, for the generations of ministry that we've had here. And God, I just pray that as we go forward from this place this, in the coming week, as we go forward to take the, the calling that you've given us seriously, Lord, that you will give us safe travel, God, that you will give us a time to not only be ministers of the gospel, but Lord, to receive ministry ourselves. And Lord, for those who are back here praying for us, God, we pray that you make them ever mindful that we go as representatives of First Baptist Williams and of the kingdom of God. So Lord, give us your Holy Spirit. Give us courage to be bold with the gospel. Give us the love that you have given to us that we may share it with others. Go with us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is your Texas mission trip group, so thank you all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay, and now we can stand back up because, and receive the benediction. So, uh, it's almost like a Catholic service. <laughs> up, down, up, down. Okay. Uh, you can count it as cardio and we'll be okay. Um, as you go out from this place, May you take the light of Christ with you. Take it into the dark places of this world, even the dark places of your own heart. And may it shine and reveal more of God to you than you've already known today. Let us pray together. Lord, go with us from this place. Lord, go before us, lighting the way. And go within us, Lord, that we may know the light of your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.